In this video, I'll give you my final picks for UFC Louisville. We'll talk DraftKings, lineup construction, how to be successful on this slate, everything you need from a DFS standpoint. And as always, you can call me Kunith. Let's make some money this week. We have 14 fights on the card this week. If you want a full card breakdown, you can watch the video from earlier in the week. That is a full card breakdown predictions for each one of these fights. That'll be linked in the description and in a pinned comment. But for DraftKings, there are so many different things that you can do this week, not only because you have so many fights compared to most of the cards that we've had recently, but you have a lot of close fights as well. The matchmakers cooked this week. And I say that because you can go down the list here and make a case for each and every underdog if you wanted to. Now we're going to get into our value plays in just a second. The value plays meaning the underdogs that we like on DraftKings. But just to give you an idea of how close the fights really are on paper, you've got Jesse Butler coming in as a huge underdog against Brad Katona right there at the top of the screen. Jesse Butler is bigger. This is a guy who fought at welterweight once upon a time, who's now fighting at bantamweight. He's going to be strong. Longer. He's a grappler. Brad Katona wants to grapple in this fight. And Katona's a fight manager. He's not somebody who's dominating. He's not somebody who's finishing. And once you get to these judges' scorecards, you always have a chance. Just look at last week. You see scorecards like Mitch Raposo winning, Cesar Almeida winning against Roman Kopilov. One of the judges had the co-main event 4-1 for Paulo Costa. Absurd. And it's not their fault. It's a job, right? You can go anywhere in America, anywhere in the world, really, and you're going to find people who are bad at their job, whether they are working in Napa Auto Parts, whether they're they are working at NASA. It doesn't matter. So keep that in mind as you're building lineups this week. You are always in it in fights that are going to go the distance. If you look down from the Butler fight, you have Stoltzfoots. He's going to have the cardio edge. He's fighting out of a good camp. He stylistically matches up very well against Bruno Ferreira. I think he can weather that early storm and put it on him late. We'll talk more about that later. Ricky Tercios, same deal. Cardio advantage. Charles Radke, physicality advantage. He can crash distance quickly and make it uncomfortable for a long rangy protest and land one of those powerful hooks in tight and win the fight. Punja Tumar, nobody knows. She has three round cardio. She's probably the better striker here. She could end up winning that fight. Dominic Reyes, light heavyweight, tons of power. Anything can happen. Cody Stamen, the better wrestler in that matchup. He could neutralize the fight if he does what he does best. Below that, you got Denise Gomes. She's got one shot knockout power at women's strawweight, which is absurd. Punahele Soriano can knock anybody out. And now he's moving down to welterweight, a weight class he's always should have been in. Jared Cannonier at 40 years old is coming off of the best performance performance of his life against a better fighter than Nasser Dean Imovov. You've got Andrea Lee, the favorite against Montana De La Rosa. They're essentially the same fighter. Montana De La Rosa is six years younger. Tiago Moises has a huge grappling advantage. He's fought higher level competition, been there, done that. I could see him winning that fight as well. Zach Reese is younger, fresher, taking less damage, slicker on the mat. He can win that fight. And then Daniel Marcos against John Castaneda, a fight that's probably going to go the distance. And Daniel Marcos has a great job of controlling pace, controlling distance, and finding Finding ways to win minutes to win fights, or at least doing that in the judge's eyes. This is a card full of landmines. So if you have like a lineup optimizer, which you can get on KunithMMA.com, you're really going to want to spread out that exposure because there are going to be a lot of dogs that bark this week. Excellent. And with that said, let's get into the value plays. Again, these are going to be underdogs on DraftKings, meaning that they're priced at 8,000 and below. Now, if you've watched a predictions video, you know which side of these matchups I prefer. Like, for example, Daniel Marcos. I like Daniel Marcos in this fight. I like him to win. I don't like to play him on DraftKings, however, because you look at that fight against Davey Grant, 55 points. You look at that fight against Aori Kilang, he probably would have went on to score a decent amount in that fight. But at 9,300, you didn't want to roster him anyway. That's going to be a bad back and forth fight with John Castaneda. Castaneda might get a takedown or two. Castaneda probably wins a round here. I predict a split decision in that fight. So I don't know if Daniel Marcos is going to do it all for you. If he's going the distance, not getting a knockdown, not getting takedowns either. I don't think from a striking standpoint, he is going to put enough out there or at least be one of the top scorers on the card. I don't think that happens. So for that reason, he is not in the value play consideration for me, although I think he's going to win. I think if anything, you want to be overweight to the field on John Castaneda or at least overweight to to Daniel Marcos. The first real value play is going to come in the form of Zach Reese at 7,900 because I like the matchup quite a bit. Julian Marquez has had a very weird run in the UFC and the fights that he's winning, it's not against guys who done well in the UFC, guys who are still on the roster. And even in the fights that he's winning, he's getting taken down, he's finding ways to get submissions at the end of the fights. And even then the fighters are tired. He kind of just muscles everything. Reese is very slick. He's very fast. He's super dynamic in comparison.
comparison to Julian Marquez, and I think he's going to go out there and put it on him. I think he finishes Marquez in the first or second round, probably by submission. And like we talked about on the predictions video, Marquez went from this guy who looked impossible to finish to getting finished in back-to-back -back fights. Now, he wasn't getting submitted, but he was getting knocked out, and he was getting knocked out badly. Zach Reese has no problem taking the center of the octagon and letting his hands go, and I think he's going to catch Julian Marquez this week, knock him down, probably submit him shortly after, and I think that he gets it done again inside of one, maybe two rounds at 7,900, getting a finish like that, hard to beat. The next value play that I like is Jared Cannonier coming off of a 155 point performance over Marvin Vittori. If you watch this fight here and think that he's not going to win this week, we look at fights very differently. Not to say I'm right or you're right, but I looked at that fight against Marvin Vittori. It was a great fight. Both guys had success at different points, but what Jared Cannonier showed in that fight was everything. He showed toughness. He was getting caught with a lot of clean shots early. These are Marvin Vittori's best shots. He ate him. He ate him well. Even when he was hurt, he recovered in a flash. On top of that, he was taking it to Marvin Vittori. He had Marvin Vittori backing up almost the entire time after that first round. And that's something to be said about Jared Cannonier. He's not taking back steps. So if moving backward over a five round fight is really sapping that gas tank, I could see him really taking it to Nasruddin Imovov, not only in the early stages, but especially late in this fight. You look at the striking numbers from his last three fights, 141, 141, 257. He knocked out Derek Brunson in the second round, scored you almost 100 DraftKings points that night at 8,600. Thank you very much. And then you've got the fight against Kelvin Gastelum, goes five rounds, knocks down Kelvin Gastelum, which not too many people are able to do, 91 strikes. But what this is telling you is look at the amount of times this guy has gone five rounds just in the last couple of years. Four out of his last five fights, five rounds, all have gone the distance and the cardio has held up. So Cannoneer down at this price with five rounds to work is somebody you have to have in value play consideration. I don't see how he doesn't show up on the optimal lineup with a W here. Punahele Soriano is somebody I really like a lot this week. We mentioned before how he's moving down to welterweight, the natural weight class for him, a weight class that he should have been fighting in the entire time. Some of the shots that you see these guys like Kapilov and Stolzfus take up here, guys at 170 aren't taken, especially in my opinion, guys like Miguel Baeza. When he first got into the UFC, he was picking up these first round knockouts and every fight that he's won in the UFC, he's had knockdowns. So you got two there, two there, one there. He can put it on you and he can do it fast. Miguel Baeza is also going to be landing as well. Baeza's got crazy fast hands, good power to go along with it. He can do a good job of chopping down that lead leg from Soriano, but we've seen Miguel Baeza rocked way more than we've seen Puna rocked. And Puna, only time he got rocked really was against Roman Kopilov, and that was also as a result of fatigue. Eating a lot of shots, getting tired in the process. It was a body kick that folded him up, and then ultimately he was TKO'd with punches, but you don't really see Puna getting rocked to the head too much. So if they're playing rock em, sock em robots in the middle of the cage, I think that's when Puna catches him with one of those big hooks that he throws. So Puna Soriano, definitely somebody you need to have in value play consideration. And then for me, that's almost it because you've got D Gomes. Obviously, she's got the power. If she gets it done, she probably shows up on the optimal lineup because it's a first round knockout. Can't deny that. Dominic Reyes is interesting. I do have him winning this fight, but what makes me nervous about playing him on DraftKings and what will keep him out of the value play consideration for me is one, the ownership. He's going to pull quite a bit of ownership this week. So will Dustin Jacoby. That's a fight that I think a lot of people are going to attack, and I think it might be a mistake. The reason why I say that is because, yes, you can look at all these knockdowns and see the high scores, which are great, but the takedown numbers are very, very low. He's not taking down Dustin Jacoby. I don't think Dustin Jacoby is going to look for takedowns either. On top of that, Dustin Jacoby's only been knocked out one time in MMA, and that was nearly 10 years ago against King Mo Lawal. So I think there's a really good chance that that fight ends up going the distance. And if that's the case, the winner of that fight, since it's going to be primarily striking, is going to score you something around like 79, maybe 80 DraftKings points. That's not really what you're looking for and I think that fight goes over owned. And below that, there are a lot of really interesting options. I think if you start to get below Dominic Reyes, one of these five come through, you are going to see them on the optimal lineup. Tomar is going to be possibly the lowest owned or the second lowest owned out of this entire group. The lowest owned probably ends up being Jesse Butler. Now, I don't like either of them this week. I think Charles Radke is going to get a decent amount of ownership at 7,000. People like what he's bringing to the table in terms of power. I get that. Ricky Tercios, not at elevation. I think is really up against it this week. I think he gets wrapped up and wrapped up pretty quickly. Dustin Stoltzfus, who we talked about in the predictions video. Tom Hardy at jujitsu competitions. This is the guy who I think could end up breaking the slate.
slate at 6800 because you look at the toughness that he brings to the table his ability to get guys to the mat also the improvements in the striking like for example you watch the striking here against Adolfo Vieira versus the striking here against Puna Soriano you could tell that's been an emphasis in his game the guy knows how to grapple he's been there done that fine but I like the grit I like the dog I really like the price too Dustin Stolzfu somebody you want to be overweight to this week but that'll do it for the value plays and if you haven't already like the video subscribe to the channel comment who your favorite value plays are down in the comments have a discussion about it tell me where I'm wrong tell me where I'm right I'd love to know but now we can use these value plays to build some lineups we'll start with your cash game lineups this week so for your cash games obviously we're going to follow the same formula that we typically do the cash game lineup that I gave out in the video last week was as good as it gets and we don't have a five round co-main event this week we have a five round main event that probably goes over so I'm going to take the main event there uh, last week we stacked the co-main event because it seemed like a more stackable fight also showed up in the optimal lineup in your tournaments as discussed give me my flowers flower emojis in the chat please we've got Nasruddin Imovov Jared Cannonier, 84.50 left over as always. We want to come down here and grab a punt play. Now the art of the punt play is you grab somebody who is going to go the distance, somebody who probably doesn't get finished too quickly. You've got a lot of options down here. What else do we want? Well, we want somebody who has a path to victory. You don't need them to win, but you hope that they can get it done for you. When it comes to pricing this week, especially because again, there are so many landmines on the card that you really just don't know. I think just paying that Jesse Butler 6600 is money well spent because it opens up so many other things for you. With 9066 left over per fighter, now you have to start looking at fighters that you feel good about. Maybe they don't light up the stat sheet. Maybe they don't score you a ton of points, but they just need to win. Somebody who I think just wins is Taylor Lapalus with his long reach advantage, ability to deny takedowns, superior footwork. I think that he takes it to Cody Stamen just by picking him apart at range, managing the distance. Distance, scoring around 60 DraftKings points like Andre Lima last week, but getting you the win. 9150 left over per fighter. I think it's hard not to go with Raul Rosas Jr., who's also very tournament viable as well, obviously. And 9000 left over. I'm probably not going to go with somebody like Dustin Jacoby. Eduardo Mora feels just fine. Ludovic Klein might be somebody who I end up with in this lineup with 600 left over. I think I'm fine with this when it comes to your cash games. And again, your cash games are going to be your 50 50s, your head to heads, your double ups. They're not going to make you rich, but it does feel good when your lineup comes through and you have it in multiple contests so let's say you put 20 40 50 dollars in there you're going to double that money and it's not like a tournament where you're either going to win a lot or you're going to lose it all and like i've talked about before i think it's important that if you are playing tournaments a lot to play some cash games to kind of offset that risk a little bit i think a better way to do that is by betting as well as playing dfs so if you play your tournaments also just play some straight bets as well it's going to be less volatile so your tournaments are going to have really high upside but also quite a bit of downside your betting is going to be a bit more consistent a bit more steady and help you offset those tournaments or help you get more money in your bankroll so you can play better tournaments and when i say better contests i mean contests that don't have as many people in them it might cost more for you to enter but also the prize pool is still pretty big i have videos on this stuff if you look in the description or go on the channel under the strategy tab but as far as betting goes to offset this if you want the official betting article and the dfs tools so lineup optimizer strategy guide data model and projections that can help you build better lineups you can visit kunithmma.com go right up to plans and grab the plan that works best for you you can get just the lineup optimizer or you can get total access for everything and like we talked about earlier in the week we are five out of the last six events having profitable betting cards we are on a heater like we've never had before so go check out the kunithmma.com plans to see what works best for you but enough of that let's get into building some tournament lineups what are we going to do in the tournaments this week well again there's a lot you can do but we'll start with just adding in some value plays and seeing where where we land zach reese is a cool option jared cannoneer is a cool option 86 25 left over per fighter you can come up here to somebody like john castaneda who again i don't think is going to win i don't prefer this side of the matchup but i do like the ownership that we're seeing 87 66 left over i might just come up a little bit more to ludovic klein i think ludovic klein is very sneaky this week as well i don't think people are dying to play him 8950 left over after that I might grab Eduardo Mora and now I've got 9100 left over per fighter I might come up here to Rayani Dos Santos because yes you're using up all of the salary not leaving salary on the table but there's a story 
that the lineup can tell. Zach Reese inside the distance, Jared Cannonier five rounds to work as the underdog is optimal with a win this week. I promise you that. Castaneda and Klein going to go under the radar. Eduara Mora is probably going to get a decent amount of ownership because she should. Look at what she did in her UFC debut. Three takedowns, second round finish, 128 DraftKings points, paid off that $9,400 salary like it was nothing, baby. Rayani Dos Santos is the wild card here because Rayani Dos Santos coming off of a loss, 9,100, probably appears to be overpriced by people who are sitting on the toilet and making lineups at the same time. Somebody might talk you into playing Punja Tomar and you know what? Cool. If you want to, do it. But I think Rayani Dos Santos is somebody who, being that it's women's MMA as well, probably comes in below 15% ownership this week. She'll be the lowest owned fighter by far when you're talking about fighters at 9,000 and above as well. So again, you didn't leave any salary on the table, but you got different, kid. You did good. We blow it up and try something else. Let's say we go with Bruno Ferreira. I know a lot of people are going to want to play him. That's cool. Let's say you went with somebody like, we'll go back down here. We'll plug in the Killa Gorilla again, just to give ourselves a good look. Since we've already got these two in here, I'm going to build what I think would be the absolute chalk this week. So I'm going to plug Dominic Reyes in there. I might come up here to somebody like, hmm, probably come up here to Zach Reese. I think Zach Reese is going to be a popular choice this week. 89.50 left over. I think people want to play Miguel Baeza. I know a lot of people are just have washed their hands with uh, with Puna. So I get that. And then you've got 9,200 left over. Carlos Prates. I've used all the salary. I play NFL DFS. I play NBA DFS. I think that way works for everything. So I use all the salary. I come over here. I'm telling you now, if this is your lineup and this is the lineup that wins, I don't care if you come in first in the big contest. You're going to damn near break even on that $15 entry because I'm telling you now, not only is everybody going to put this lineup in, but if I brought my cat into the room and had her pick a lineup, she would tell you that this is probably what would show up. So let's give you another look. Let's say you went with somebody like Eduardo Mora. Let's say you came up here to Raul Rosas Jr. Let's say you went all the way down here to Dustin Stolzfu. So now we're starting to, to dig in the crates a little bit. Let's say you wanted to come up here to Castaneda, 84.50 left over. Let's say we gave you the look with Nasruddin Imovov. So if for you Frenchman backers there, Nasruddin Imovov, live and direct. And at this point, it's hard not to click the Zach Reese button or even the Puna button. Uh, that would be what I would recommend if you were in this situation. So let's start over then. So let's say you wanted to open the lineup up with Carlos Prates at the top. Let's say you went with Dustin Jacoby. Again, I don't like Dustin Jacoby to win here, but he is fighting Dominic Reyes. And if you look at the guys who have fought Dominic Reyes as of late, they're lighting up the stat sheet. They're lighting up DraftKings scores. If you were to play one side of that matchup, Dustin Jacoby is the preferred side. He's going to come in at lower ownership because of his price, and he's got the higher upside in that opening round. So Dustin Jacoby at 9,000 is a fine play this week, and definitely an under-owned piece when it comes to the tournaments. Let's say you went with Cannoneer. Let's say you went with Puna. Let's say you went down here with Stolzfus, and then you came all the way back up here to Raul Rosas Jr. Left 600 salary on the table. I'm not mad at this at all. What story does this tell? You've got knockout upside with that long straight left hand of Carlos Prates. You've got Dustin Jacoby fighting what is a potentially a dust chin. Cannoneer, of course, Puna, we talked about this, big power, Dustin Stolzfus, that price versus what he can do if he wins inside the distance, which probably likely if he wins, it's going to be in the third round. Not only that, but he's going to have to put volume out there. Like he's a guy with better hands, but he doesn't have a ton of power. So he's going to go out there, pepper you, take you down, maybe take your back and submit you. That is good when it comes to scoring. So if he wins in the third round, I could see him scoring 95 points. And then Raul Rosas Jr., very live to get it done in one. I could see a situation like against Jay Perrin. He just kind of ran through and scored 106 DraftKings points. Now that'll do it for the tournament lineups. I just wanted to give you a look. Now what I want to give you is some free money. Now this clean as a whistle UI that you're looking at right here is brought to you by Underdog Fantasy, partner of the channel, friend of the show, big respect both ways. Underdog is being very aggressive about getting your business. So they're going to be offering you bonuses that are bigger than most places in the industry. They're looking at $250 bonuses for people who sign up for the first time. Go to Underdog Fantasy, open an account with them, make your first deposit. They'll match the deposit. They'll give you some play money as well on top that you can win if you can keep it or keep it 
if you can win. Oscar, fix the fucking script. But what I'm gonna do for you now is give you the can't miss slip of the week. This is gonna be the best slip you've ever seen and I'm gonna show you right now and then you're gonna place it and say, damn, Kunith, I won all this money because you were right, the slip can't miss. I know, I know that, thank you. But Andrea Lee, now that is 0.65X multiplier. So I want something to kind of offset that because we don't wanna lose out on multiplier. So let me offset that with a little salsa picante from Raul Rosas Jr. there. We've got submission at 1.75X. Another one that I really like here would be John Castaneda for over 70 and a half or higher than 70 and a half significant strikes. I think that's a solid one. Ludovic Klein with 51 and a half significant strikes. I think we'll land there. We need one more. The line I think I like the most out of what's left is probably Carlos Prates at 39 and a half significant strikes. I think he goes over that number. So we're at a 22 0.7x multiplier you go ahead and throw twenty dollars on that it's going to pay you 455 so again that's the can't miss slip for underdog fantasy this week there will be a link in the description and it will be in a pinned comment for you to go there use the first time deposit link of mine and that way it's going to match your first deposit give you the bonuses things like that you can also use promo code kunath k-u-n-a-t-h if you are making your first deposit ever other links that you're going to find in the description the video from earlier in the week you've probably watched that if you've gotten to this point in the video there's also going to be the link to the one dollar winner take all contest on DraftKings. that's a private contest but if you've made it to this point in the video i thank you so much for watching i really do appreciate it make sure you like the video subscribe to the channel comment something for the algorithm and i wish you the best of luck at ufc louisville and i'll see you next week let's go